right, Karen, welcome to Teachers in America. I'm so glad to meet you, one of our authors on our Into Science program. Um, but, you know, just like we like to do in Teachers in America, we like to take everybody back to um, their teacher journey. So to connect with our audience and, you know, as we go through the interview to get us even more excited about science, let's start off. Will you share with us your teacher journey, where you started and where you are now? Where I started and where I am now. I started in the trenches <laughs> in Minnesota as an elementary and middle school teacher. Then I went on to teach at the college level and at uh, Texas State University, which was Southwest Texas State University when I began. And I ended up at the University of Texas at Austin after a stopover in the University of Texas at Arlington, where I was recruited to be their director of science education and start all their science education programs. Wow. So what, I mean, what would have led you from being an elementary middle to like, okay, I'm going to go teach college and not only go from Minnesota, but Texas. <laughs> so that was part of the journey. Uh, I, I love teaching and I, in Minnesota and I, I love learning. Uh, and I was a science teacher, and so I loved learning science, and I enjoyed learning how to teach science to students and seeing the results. And as a result, I stayed connected to the University of Minnesota uh, with a lot of the people that were doing uh, great research in what helps students learn, such as cooperative learning with the Johnson brothers. And so I was like uh, their... Uh, person in the trenches that they could get to do their research. <laughs> and so I was always connected to the university. And so I was always taking classes and I was always learning. And uh, pretty soon I had a PhD. <laughs> and I actually stayed in the classroom because I just had a blast teaching. I loved it. Uh, and but then it got to the point where my son was going off to college and I was thinking, well, why don't I go off to college too? So I ended up teaching in Texas. <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, I have to remember that when my daughter, like, oh, I want to go to college too. Like, I <laughs> about the same. I think that's just so lovely and sweet. Did you have a favorite grade that you taught? Or do you remember a, a specific set of students that just really cemented, you know, why you went into this profession? I really enjoyed sixth grade and the challenge of teaching them and to bring it all together and eventually it all comes back together. But I think it was just so much fun to teach them. At one time, they're uh, like a little kid. Then mm -hmm. at the other time, they show some uh, tendency towards becoming an adult. Mm -hmm. And so you're aiming, you're, you're, you have a moving target where you're trying to teach them. And so every day was a challenge. It was never boring. It was always interesting. And the kids come with all of their background and it's fun to find out about it and then learn how to teach to it. I agree with you with that, like assessment. I, Cause one year I, I, I used taught middle school and seventh grade and eighth grade and eighth grade is my favorite. I mean, I've taught, you know, through ninth, 10th grade and eighth grade was always my favorite. And my principal came to me when she's like, you're going to need to go teach sixth grade. Now I'm, you know, reading, I was like, I started crying. I was like, I, I don't know what to do with sixth graders. I think they're still so little. They cry. She's like, well, you're crying. So that'll be one connection. And she says, but Give yourself that chance that you'll see that moment where they pivot, where they begin to, you know, really leave that elementary to become that middle age um, learner. So you're, I agree with you spot on. I see that you were president of NSTA. I definitely want to know, you know, what it was like leading um, educators across the country as president of, you know, NSTA. Why, again, was that another part of the, your journey? And what you learned from that? Well, to begin with, NSTA stands for the National Science Teaching Association. And I was president at a very exciting time. It was when the Next Generation Science Standards were released. 
Oh. And so NSTA had a key role in launching NGSS. And so I had the opportunity to go all over the country and uh, introduce teachers to the idea of 3D learning, which is very similar to the new TEACs. They might have a little different name of what they call it, like cross-cutting concepts or recurring themes and concepts. Really, they're talking about the same thing. So uh, I had an opportunity and I learned so much about teachers and how eager they were to really find some great instructional strategies that they could use in their classroom to help all students learn science. So it was very rewarding experience to be on the cutting edge there of implementing the NGSS. What When you talk about um, a best practice, the strategy, like what immediately comes to your eye and what, I mean, into your mind and what would you want teachers who teach science all the way from kindergarten to 12th grade? What, what does that mean strategies in science? If you don't mind me asking from somebody who is more of a literacy expert um, intervention and have a minor in biology, but only taught science one year in my career. <laughs> so what does it look like? Uh, I think uh, instructional strategies that engage students in the learning process and that uh, get around barriers that students might have to learning. And so you, your research shows you need high quality instructional materials. So you want something that allows students, no matter what their challenges are about learning, whether they're visual learners, auditory learners, kinesthetic learners, that students are able to see it, hear it, do it in order to learn the concepts and science. So you need a program that's going to give teachers instructional strategies to hit all of those modes. So when you think about other the interesting things and other changes that have been happening in science education, what are some of the most ex you know, exciting parts about the new TEKS and, and relating that, that even if I'm a teacher who's not in Texas, what can I glean from what you're going to share? Well, uh, just like NGSS, the new TEKS have engineering practices. And not only do they have scientific and engineering practices, they have it integrated into the content. And then I also like, as I mentioned before, the idea of uh, recurring themes and concepts. And to me, I, I like to think of your mind as kind of a filing box. And so you're learning all these science concepts, which may seem in some cases to be isolated. But what recurring themes and concepts do is they give you a way to file that. Oh, this is a pattern. It's like patterns that we have in life science and physical science and earth and space science. And so you have a way to retrieve that information. You know, scientists say that everything we've ever learned is up there. We just don't have the retrieval system to get it out. And so to me, that gives us that retrieval system and allows us then to apply those concepts, which, as I said, can be isolated to solve a problem, say, in engineering. Um, and also, we have um, the content, of course. It's not just, you know, as I say, isolated. Now, the content is integrated with the scientific and engineering practices, and it's all pulled together with the recurring themes and concepts. So I think this idea of 3D learning, we didn't see that in the last set of cheats, but it's kind of following the lead of NGSS, seeing what we have in that that might've worked, that we might apply now to our new cheats. Do you see that being one of the first things, um, maybe a district leader or um, you know a team that's gonna be bringing in and supporting teachers with the new cheats? That do you envision somewhere the recurring themes poster or, you know, everybody being able to really like know what those are, see them in the teaks and be able to sort of do that vertical and horizontal, you know, alignment? Like, what are you visioning that's going to be the conversations happening in districts to support getting teachers ready? Well, I with recurring themes and concepts, mm -hmm. I think it's a way of thinking. And so it's a way of, these cut across all the science disciplines. And so it's a way of organizing it and being able to use it. So for example, patterns or cause and effect, 
we have them in all areas of science. So if I do this, this is going to happen. That's a cause and effect. So it's just kind of a way of organizing and making sense of all the concepts that we have in science. Nice. When was the last time the takes were were changed? When or in twenty seventeen? Twenty seventeen. So six years ago. What's the mood? What are you seeing in the field? What are you hearing from teachers about? You know, what where are they feeling about this new update? I think some of the things that are exciting for teachers is it's not a textbook anymore, <laughs> that it is digital. Uh, and the, we know that that's how kids are interacting now digitally. And then, so they understand that environment and it offers so much more. It's not static anymore. It's dynamic. So if we take a look, we can embed a video into it. We can have a virtual lab where they move things around on the screen. And best of all to me is students are given little bites of information and then there's some sort of a feedback mechanism. So they interact with a checkpoint and they get feedback about it. And I think then, then that helps you learn it when you get the feedback on it and, and you're checking the little, you're not giving a whole, you know, big amount of information. You're giving little bites and then having them check that they got that one and then we go on to the next one. And so I think the digital world is uh, something that teachers are looking forward to. Very exciting. So when you think about that digital side and you think about, um, you know, classrooms, what what are you envisioning are the sounds of the classroom? How like how the instruction is introduced? Um, and and again, it's not from a textbook. So, you know, think about the sounds of the classroom, the visuals. What are you thinking is happening and how are students sitting together and working independently and also working collaboratively? So I'll start by saying the role of the student is going to change. The student is going to be an active participant in their learning, and they're going to be able to direct their learning, too, in different ways. Uh, the teacher is going to be more in the role of a facilitator, a guide, and maybe a co-learner with the students as well. I still envision students working collaboratively. And I hope that that's the case that uh, the classroom is set up so they can work collaboratively together because they learn from each other. So um, I envision small groups of students interacting in the digital media. Uh, I uh, envision the teacher going around asking questions and interacting with the students and the students are interacting with not only their own group, but other groups as well. You say that was just, I mean, you're like so full of energy, such a big smile. When thinking about all learners, what what is I what do I need to be thinking about as a teacher when I read the new teaks, when I'm understanding and looking at, you know, my new curriculum? What do I need to think about all my learners? How how do I need to think about my most, you know, needed students who might not be reading? at grade level, my multilingual language learners. Is there anything in there that I need to be aware of or barriers that I need to be begin to think about as a teacher and also working in and having conversations with my leadership? So, well, let's talk about barriers. So I see three types of barriers. There are emotional barriers and those have to do with the fear of failure. And so I think in the new digital programs, uh, students are not going to really be able to experience that as they did using a textbook and with a regular class, which may have been more lecture based. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I mentioned checkpoints. So depending on what the students choose, it may or may not be the right response, but they get some feedback on that. I wish there was a big sign in every classroom that said mistakes are made here because mm -hmm. uh, you probably heard the saying that fail means first attempt in learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it, it, to uh, decrease those emotional barriers, students have to feel like I can do this. And I think a program that allows them to interact with it and to try again if they don't quite have it, 
is going to give them the sense that I can do it. It's going to build positive attitudes. So um, then secondly, there's motivation. So students say, why do I have to learn this? And the new programs with the introduction to uh, a new unit that deals with phenomena, and then students go through and they collect information so that they can solve a problem or explain a phenomena, that uh, again, that's another barrier. This keeps them motivated. And then finally, we just have personal challenges. Every learner is unique. And so we have to hit all modalities, as I mentioned before, that students are able to see it, they're able to do it, they're able to hear it. If you do that, the challenges that students have that hold them back, barriers are just you know, challenges that they're not fully engaged in the learning process, that's going to overcome them because there's a way they can learn the material. I I agree. And I think it's also so like when you think about digital and, you know, where our learners are, they're also seeing their age make some, I mean, make huge revelations and be part of, you know, not holding back like, oh, I have an idea of how you could solve this. I'm going to send this to my state representative and that kind of thing. And I just think that that's something that never would have happened, you know, in my generation growing up in the 80s like you had that textbook you were told read this section use your sub thing and be able to answer these questions and I just remember I I did like science I you know was but there was that whole part of me that was just traumatized because I didn't was not the type of the learner that liked to just read and answer questions read and answer questions or verbatim take notes from the teacher if I would have had more of a exploratory let's start with the phenomenon let's you know let me show you why this is important I've I know I would have had a different experience but we that's not how it was taught back then and um way back then but <laughs> I think that's part of where we think about when looking at a curriculum when looking at science curriculum you know what are the important ways that you know teachers and students you know, are supported by a curriculum so that they are meeting the new TEKS. Like when you're thinking about how you're looking at new curriculum, what's your advice on that to see my teachers and my students are going to be supported in this curriculum? So I, I don't want to um, kind of get away from the fact too that uh, the digital world is like a textbook because we also, after we had like just textbooks, then we had all of the hands-on programs. And mm -hmm. so you really need a combination. And so I think you, those need to be embedded. The hands-on activities as well are very important. So- uh, You mean like what, like having those manipulatives, having, mm -hmm. you know, having those um, experiments, you know, set up where they're doing that in classroom, not just, virtually or assimilating, you're yes. saying they need to be able to touch this, see it firsthand as well. So it's a hybrid, it's a mix. Yes. And sometimes it's just not practical to do things in the real world. And then I love it that there are some of the virtual labs that can be done when things are dangerous or expensive or too big or too small or whatever, that we do have them virtually as well as hands-on. But I think you see so you need the combination of all that to help students learn. So what are my tips? <laughs> right. What are your tips to make sure you see that, right? Then you don't go one way too far one way and not the other. I hope that teachers, when they have these new programs, will see teaching as an art and a science. It's really both. And they embrace that as they're going through it. Uh, I think they need to look at the roles. As I said, students are going to be more in an active learning. Teachers are going to be more of the guide on the side. You've probably heard that expression mm -hmm. before. Um, I think the new technology, I mean, we really in previous programs, this is the first time when we see what a powerful tool the technology can be and all the things we can do with it that you couldn't do with just a textbook and you can't do it with just hands-on. Um, I think they're going to ease out of that role as I'm the dispenser of all the facts. 
to know all the students are going to gather the facts and I'm going to help them do that. Uh, so they need a curriculum that's going to support the new roles uh, that teachers have and the new roles that students have. And the research shows that high quality instructional materials help students learn. And yes, because they also want to touch them, be in there and I'm um, doing it. It's like, you know, you got to have it. You got to have the whole the whole package. So let's let's summarize what we what we discussed. I'm a leader who's looking at the new teaks. Quick advice. What's the number one thing where I should start, what I should be thinking about? And then we'll go to the teacher and then we'll think about, you know, how we introduce this and what what's your top way of bringing students again into understanding you're not a passive learner anymore you're an active learner is that fair we'll go through that phase as okay. a summary so let's start with the leader as a leader i consider myself a whole leader in science education i want teachers to understand this 3d approach that was introduced with ngss and now it's been refined and it's used in the teeks so instead of teaching, uh, also the engineering is coming in now, which is applying the science concepts. So instead of teaching uh, the science practices, they call them scientific practices in the cheeks and the engineering practices, that these are integrated with the content, that they go together. And I want them to understand about the uh, recurring themes and concepts. How do you, that's a questioning strategy to me. How do I use that questioning strategy to help students learn, master the skills, which are engineering and scientific practices, and the knowledge? So as a leader, I think I want to focus on the 3D dimension because we haven't had that in our last iteration of the TEKS. Okay. And then I'm a teacher. I know the TEKS are being updated. I know, you know, new curriculum is going to be out there. What, where do I put my focus? I think <laughs> the new programs, they have to be like right on without, without a lot of extra information. Just tell me what I need to teach the first time through it. I just want some guidance. Let me go through it and then I can adjust it to my style and everything. But I think you just, you've got to address the cheeks <laughs> and you've got to be right on with them and just give them the information so that they can see how it works. Teachers make it their own, but they need the basics. Just give me the basics so I can go through it and see how we do this 3D teaching, how we put it all together. So don't give too much information, just enough. <laughs> just enough. Just that secret, just enough. Um, and then when you think about the learner, right? You, do you think, um, you know, I think every child, every student across is ready to be an active learner when we empower them and we give them the that agency. But when we think about preparing the student from kindergarten through 12, like, first week of school, how do we begin to share with students? The expectation is we are an active learner. I'm not going to be standing up here just giving you the information. You're going to be part of the phenomenon and exploring it and investigating and doing the experiments. How do I start that in my first week to just build that culture into my classroom? Well, uh, if you look at the cheats, they really recommend that you start with phenomena. And that's the motivational factor that I've got to figure this out. I've got to be able to explain it or I've got to be able to solve an engineering problem. That's what the phenomena is. And so I think it's the way the teacher introduces it to the students that here's some phenomena. You know, let's see if we can gather the information. And that's the science content. And using the scientific and engineering practices to get that contact so that I can solve this phenomena. And so I think it's kind of a new approach to learning science. And that is going to engage the students in the learning process. Well, I just have enjoyed our conversation. I love how I see you so energetic and, you know, it's not just the wearing of the magenta, the color of the year. It's, you know, everything that you're bringing about just the excitement around science instruction, you know, the new teaks, all of it. 
So I'm not going to shy away, Karen, from asking you the question I ask every teacher who joins this, because I have a feeling you have a playlist, you have your, you blast music at different volumes. I don't know if you're the same volume as me, but <laughs> you're walking in to present to an entire room of Texas teachers. You're, you are so excited. You're on fire. What music is playing? What's your walk-up song? Maybe the Rocky theme. <laughs> I'm also a marathon runner. So. Really? Okay. So you know steady wins the race. You're like, you're always like beating your best time. Well, I like it. I I too always just call it the Rocky theme. I think it has a um a title, but we'll go with the Rocky yeah. theme. Because my team is always like, no, Noel, don't pull it up because sometimes I accidentally play the music and then <laughs> That messes up the podcast. It's like, but, give you the idea. You can do it. Let's you go. Can, let's, let's you can do it. Don't see it. all the steps. See one <laughs> step at a time and get that feedback um, throughout. Karen, this has just been um, amazing. I appreciate you joining teachers You know, in America. I appreciate you coming in as you know, an author who is accessible and, you know, we can relate as teachers and across. Um, so thank you, everything that you do. And thank you for, you know, being a part of the change and getting science out there and being the best, you know, part of that curriculum that you can. <laughs> thank you. It's been fun to talk with you. <laughs> you too. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the Teachers in America podcast, please email us at shaped at hmhco.com. Be the first to hear new episodes of Teachers in America by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you enjoy today's show, please rate, review, and share it with your network. You can find the transcript of this episode on our Shaped blog by visiting hmhco.com forward slash shaped. The link is in the show notes. The Teachers in America podcast is a production of HMH. Executive producers are Christine Condon and Tim Lee. Editorial direction is by Christine Condon. It is creatively directed and audio engineered by Tim Lee. Our producer and editor is Jennifer Carujo. Production designers are Mia Fry and Thomas Velasquez. Shape blog post editors for the podcast are Christine Condon, Jennifer Carujo, and Alicia Ivory. Thanks again for listening.